Cultivate your mind as a farmer cultivates his fields. Gradually clear the land, prepare the soil, plow the rows, sow the seeds, spread the manure, water the plants, and pull the weeds. Eventually you'll reap a golden harvest. The Mulberry Grove Tapai spent her formative teenage years working hard. Diligent and energetic by nature, she always worked on her own initiative without needing to be coaxed or coerced. One year when the harvest was complete and the raw grain was safely stored away, she eagerly embarked on the planting of a mulberry grove. The putai specialized in raising silkworms for the sake of turning the raw silk strands from their cocoons into thread and fabric, and mulberry leaves were the silkworm's main diet. Once a mulberry tree's fruit ripened, its leaves were cut and spread out inside wide, shallow baskets full of silkworms. Tapai knew that a grove of mulberry trees would be a profitable resource, providing an additional source of livelihood for her family. Tapai had learned about silkworm farming from her stepmother, and now intended to produce her own independent source of mulberry leaves. Tapai took pleasure in clearing a patch of high ground at the far end of her family's field, a large knoll of partially forested land suitable for a mulberry grove. Working diligently, she cleared and leveled the ground. In the flat clearings, surrounded by shady hardwood trees that protected the saplings from the harsh sun, Tapai planted the mulberry trees. She tended them carefully until they took firm root and began to flourish in the damp tropical heat. As soon as the trees in her grove matured, she planned to begin raising silkworms. Not long thereafter, Tapai overheard a Chan Man explaining to the villagers that he was looking for a suitable place to spend the rains retreat. He wanted a broad stretch of high ground where the foliage was not too dense, and where the earth had some exposure to the drying heat of the sun, so that the dampness would not become too oppressive during the long, wet monsoon season. Tapai immediately thought of her mulberry grove. It rose above the rice fields on a hillock, allowing the rainwater to drain away easily. The breezes off the rice fields helped blow away the humidity and keep the area cool. The level clearings where she had planted the mulberry trees were suitable for building bamboo huts, and the forest trees provided adequate seclusion. After consulting with her father and her brothers, she invited Ajahn Mun to visit her property so that he could see its suitability for himself. When Ajahn Mun showed delight and satisfaction with the environment, she smiled joyfully and prepared to beg the great master to accept the land as a gift and, out of compassion for her, to spend the rains retreat there. But, before she could open her mouth to speak, he declared loudly for all to hear that the grove was precisely the kind of place he needed to build a small monastery for the coming rains. Taken by surprise at first, Tapai forgot to speak, as though everything was settled and nothing further needed to be said. Ajahn Mun turned to her with a quizzical smile. In her heart, the mulberry grove already belonged to him. They both knew that. All that remained was a formal offer from her. Tapai quickly bowed to her knees, prostrated three times at his feet, and begged him to kindly accept the piece of land as a gift from her entire family. Ajahn Mun nodded his assent and blessed her generosity. He assured her that, by the fruit of the merit she had just made, she would never be poor in her lifetime. Ajahn Mun's new monaster was called Wat Nong Nong, taking its name from a nearby low-lying swamp. Led by Tapai's father, the village men quickly got to work, felling and sawing small trees and cutting and splitting bamboo to construct simple huts for Ajahn Mun and his disciples. Ajahn Mun allowed only twelve monks to live with him at Wat Nong Nong during the rains, having the remainder branch out to different locations in Kam Jai district, with each small group living in dependence on one of the many village settlements in the area. Ajahn Mun deliberately kept his disciples spread out in separate locations that were not too close to one another, but yet close enough to Wat Nong Nong so that they could easily seek his advice when encountering problems in their meditation. This arrangement suited everyone, as too many monks living in close proximity could become a hindrance to meditation. Although the grass-roofed huts were quite small at Wat Nong Nong, the central sala had to be large enough to house 50 to 60 monks who would gather regularly from different locations on lunar observance days to hear recitations of the monastic rules. The village elders therefore took great care in its construction, cutting and trimming solid hardwood posts and beams to strengthen the structural framework and raising the floor on stilts to a height of four feet to protect against flooding and heavy downpours. 
Dabai was seated in the congregation at Wat Nong Nong to celebrate the first day of the rains retreat. From his elevated seat, Ajahn Mun addressed a large crowd of local supporters that spilled out of the sala and onto the ground below, where straw mats were spread out to accommodate them. He opened by expounding the virtues of giving, and Tapai felt a warm glow lift her heart as she recognized that her gift of land had made this inspiring occasion possible. In a powerful, thundering voice, he explained that the real value of giving is the merit gained from acts of self-sacrifice. The most meritorious gifts are those given freely to benefit others without hoping for anything in return, other than the good results of the act of generosity itself. The spiritual qualities obtained from that charitable effort are experienced in the heart as merit and goodness, and the inspiration behind the good intention to give comes from the heart. He emphasized that it is the heart that sows the seeds of virtue, and the heart that reaps the harvest. Acts of generosity are an investment for the future, for they are the foundations of a favorable rebirth. Next, Ajahn Mun expounded the virtues of moral conduct. He explained that the moral virtue gained by faithfully observing the five moral precepts is the foundation for being a decent human being. Each of the five precepts carries a particular benefit. By refraining from harming living beings, we can expect to enjoy good health and longevity. By refraining from stealing, our wealth and property will be safe from theft and misfortune. By refraining from adultery, partners will be faithful toward each other and live contentedly without feeling guilt or shame. By refraining from lying, we will always be trusted and respected for our integrity. By refraining from intoxicants, we will guard our intelligence and remain bright, knowledgeable people who are not easily misguided or thrown into confusion. People who maintain a high level of moral virtue tend to reassure living beings everywhere by conveying a sense of contentment and mutual trust and by promoting this feeling in others. The supportive and protective power of morality ensures rebirth into higher realms of existence. So, those who adhere to high moral standards will surely reach a heavenly destination in their next life. And, while such goodness comes of virtuous living, Ajahn Man went on to explain that meditation brings the greatest rewards of all. The heart is the most important element in the whole universe, and one's material and spiritual welfare depend on the heart's well-being. He said that one lives by means of the heart, both the contentment and the dissatisfaction one feels in this life are experienced in the heart. When one dies, one departs by means of the heart. One is reborn according to one's gamma, with the heart as the sole cause. Because it is the source of everything, one's heart should be trained in the right way so that one conducts oneself properly now and in the future. Through meditation, the heart can be trained correctly. By using meditation to rein in unruly thoughts, one can lay a firm foundation for spiritual calm and contentment. For the next three months, Dapai applied herself wholeheartedly to her meditation practice. Supported by her strong faith in Ajahn Mun and nurtured by his wise counsel, her practice developed quickly. Being naturally inclined to have visions and to experience psychic phenomena, she encountered many surprising and mysterious things in her samadhi practice each night. Recognizing her inherent abilities, Ajahn Mun showed a special attentiveness to Dabai. As he sat in meditation each night, he directed the flow of his consciousness toward her to investigate her current state of mind. Thus, he was constantly aware of her meditation experiences. When he saw that her practice was exceptional on a particular night, he asked her the next day to come to see him at the monastery. Just after dawn each morning, Dabai put food into Ajahn Mun's bowl when he walked through the village on his daily alms round. Standing in line with the other villagers, she waited as Ajahn Mun received alms food from those ahead of her. Ajahn Mun rarely spoke with anyone while walking for alms, but on days when he saw that Dabai's meditation had been especially good, he stopped as she put food in his bowl and asked her to come visit him after he finished eating. Accompanied by her family, Dabai walked to the monastery later that morning. When she began telling Ajahn Mun of her unusual experiences, the monks staying with him quickly gathered around to listen. They were eager to hear her stories about the non-physical realms of existence and to listen to Ajahn Mun's instructions on how to deal with them. Ajahn Mun always gave Dabai a warm-hearted welcome and listened sympathetically to everything she said. He realized that her mind inherently possessed venturesome and dynamic tendencies that easily put her in direct contact with various phenomena that the average person could not perceive. He was able to use his vast experience in these matters to give her timely and cogent advice. 
Soon, a strong spiritual bond developed between the venerable meditation master and his young pupil. Tabai became deeply devoted to Ajahn Man, and she felt privileged to get so much of his time and attention. One day, shortly after the end of the annual three-month rains retreat, Ajahn Man sent for Tabai. He told her that he and his monks would soon leave the district to continue wandering from place to place in the traditional style of Tutanga monks. He glanced down at her with eyebrows arched and a faint smile on his lips, and asked her if she had a boyfriend. Tapai shook her head and said no. He nodded slowly and suggested she could ordain as a white-robed renunciant and follow him on his travels, if she wished. But she must first receive her father's permission. She stared up at him, speechless, and he silently coaxed her for an answer. Groping for a deep breath and the right words, Tapai said she wanted to ordain and go with him, but that she feared her father would never allow it. With a reassuring smile and a short flick of his head, a John Mun sent her home. Tapai's father gave the proposal a cold reception. He refused to grant her permission to ordain because he feared that, should his daughter later disrobe and return to lay life, she would meet difficulties in finding a husband. He urged her to enjoy a normal life and be satisfied with her lay religious practices. Receiving the news with a knowing smile, a John Mun encouraged Tapai to be patient. Her time would come. Meanwhile, she had to follow his parting instructions explicitly. He forcefully insisted that she stop practicing meditation after his departure. He told her she must be content to live a worldly life for the time being. When the right time came, she would have another opportunity to develop her meditation skills. He promised her that in the future another qualified teacher would come to guide her on the right path. In the meantime, she must be patient. A John Mun saw that Tapai's mind was extremely adventurous and dynamic by nature. She did not yet have sufficient control over her mental focus to meditate safely on her own. Should something untoward occur in her meditation, she would have no one to help her in his absence. He realized that she needed a highly skilled meditation teacher who could rein her in when she got out of hand. Otherwise, she could easily go the wrong way and do damage to herself. For that reason, he forbade her to meditate after he left. Although Tabai did not understand Ajahn Mun's reasons for this strict prohibition, she had enormous faith in him. So, she abruptly stopped her practice, even though she wanted to continue so much that she felt her heart would break. It would be another twenty years before she picked up her meditation practice again.